welcome everyone to a rather irregular but occasionally entertaining Chewing Gum for the Ears podcast with myself, Steve Litchfield, and... It's Ted Salmon, once again. As if you hadn't heard enough of me and us, you've got more. It's the, it's the <laughs> blessed coronavirus causing us all to be locked down and driven insane, so we're going to do more podcasts to drive you guys insane. Nothing else to do. Indeed, indeed. Anyway, show notes at stevelitchfield.com slash music. Um, there we are, and you can just subscribe by RSS, and it's also in iTunes, and you'll find us. If you haven't listened to this before, make sure you're subscribed, because when we do put an episode out, maybe every two or three months, um, then you will hear it. And Malcolm Bryant's got some feedback on that very topic, Ted. On that very topic, yeah. And I think this is show 20. Did you say that? Um, not that we're really <laughs> counting these chewing gum for the ear shows, but this is the 20th one. Malcolm Bryant says, although the MeWe group has low activity and low membership, I might, I might add, I do check there from time to time and have enjoyed recommendations from Ted and others. If you both have the inclination, I think that it, between two and four podcasts a year is the right frequency. Would be a shame to discontinue altogether. Yeah, I kind of agree with that, but I do um, feel a little bit like a, a fraud when I'm doing this because I, uh, my music taste is so kind of outdated, and there's there's certainly nothing much here for younger people, and it's probably mostly our, us old farts that will be able to reference anything we're talking about. Don't you think, Steve? Absolutely, but I think it's a. Uh... I think it's absolutely fine that we treat this as a strictly occasional podcast. We do it when we want to, when we have something to say, when we have something we want to chat about, or when we want to fill a lockdown space. So either way, yeah, here's another chewing gum for the ears, and hopefully people will enjoy it. I wanted to chat in particular, Ted, about something I've been doing over the last 48 hours. Up in the loft, I found two boxes of CDs I'd completely forgotten about. These... this something along the lines of 100 different CDs um, from the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s and noughties. That's some I've, I had had on my iTunes on my Mac and on my various SD cards and phones, whatever, but an awful lot I'd completely forgotten about. So it was a real a breath of fresh air and a blast from the past to go through these 100 CDs and to get them onto my various systems and to enjoy them all over again. But the thing is, a lot of these CDs are from the the initial dawn of the CD era, so 1980s, 1990s, where they basically just took the the vinyl, um, occasionally some rough master tape, and just said, OK, it's digital, it's on CD, deal with it. And it's great because it was CD, it wasn't going to warp, it wasn't going to wow, it wasn't going to flutter, it wasn't going to scratch, all of that. But... Um, in each case, as each CD has come out of the case, I've stuck it in the, the, the CD drive to rip it and thought, hang on a minute, I wonder. And in at least half the cases, there is a more modern digital version, either labelled a deluxe version or a remastered version with a later date on it. So, for example, you'd have a 1980s album and it's and my CD dates from the 1980s. If you go on online, I shan't say where because it might be slightly suspect, but there are sites and applications you can use. Um, and lo and behold, there's a 2009 digital remaster where they've gone back to the original master 24 track tapes and done a whole, you know, brought out every last detail and reduced any, any d defects to nothing. And it just sounds fantastic. Occasionally you get an extra track or two. So I know that's not strictly 100 percent legal, but I have paid for the album. I've paid the artist. They've got the royalties and the publishing company have got their royalties. So I'm just getting a higher quality digital master and i've been really enjoying it so for every cd i take it out look at what's available and if there is a, is a digital remaster available i grab that and i then use that as my music master on all my music systems so it's a bit long-winded but i've enjoyed it it's, it's a, just a fun process to take every album on its own merits remember why i bought it in the first place remember all the good and the bad bits and then to go looking for what's been done to that album in the meantime yeah, and I I totally agree with that, and I think that the next stage on from that is getting back into vinyl, um, which I've spoken about on chewing gum before, um, and I know that you you don't really you you haven't got into that, <laughs> but it, but it is really really satisfying to find those albums. I went through a period of five years, um, or so, maybe even ten years, when I was collecting as they got released just the specific ones that i love the music i love and i've got about 120 albums now 
and yeah, you're absolutely right. Going back and um, and 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 listening to those and and having all the original artwork and it must be yeah, yeah. just as satisfying as what you're saying about going through all those CDs v- for you. Yeah, absolutely. When I oh, back in the 70s and 80s, I had lots of LPs, the vinyl. I mean, I had a collection about the same as you, I guess, 150 LPs. And at some point in the past, I sold them because I was short of money and thought, well, I'm never going to play vinyl again. I've got cassette and then CD. So why would I play vinyl? But you're absolutely right. There is a certain enjoyment of taking a 12 inch vinyl album out of its full size sleeve. None of these looking at CD sleeve notes with a magnifying glass artwork (laughs) you can actually enjoy. And quite a lot of them came with posters as well. I remember famously Dark Side of the Moon had a huge Mm. pyramid in a dark blue pyramid that I had on my bed bedroom wall when I was a teenager. So, yeah, yeah. so there's all of that to enjoy from the vinyl world. So I completely get where you're coming from. In terms of actual music quality, when I'm out and about exercising or or you know, even just working, I, I like the convenience of digital music and knowing that nothing's going to go wrong. Yeah. But I, at the same time, I completely concur with your hobby, if you like, of collecting vinyl as well. Yeah, yeah, it's all, it's good all round and. And on that very topic of digital, I, I was going to bring up the subject of headphones. I've been, as you as you know, I've been um, playing with an iPhone um, recently. And one of the things that I rediscovered was iTunes. And, I, and it all came back to me about how wonderful it was and how much enjoyment I got out of um, categorizing and having all the stuff on my computer. Yeah. Um, on, on a, in my case, on a Windows computer, but it, even better on a, a Mac with iTunes. Um, and and it's just it's just great fun to have that um, that whole collection of stuff going on. And, and I was going to put a, if anyone's listening to this that, that have got any ideas about um, other Windows 10 software that is like iTunes but is not Apple based, something that is equally fun to play with but doesn't rely on um, Apple software, something independent. Um, I'd like to you know start off, maybe I'll start a thread on that in, in MeWe and see what people what ideas people have got about that because one thing I have been enjoying is that categorization and collection and a lot of it's to do with with collection. And one of the other things, as I say, I, I've been playing with headphones and appreciating the how good bluetooth is particularly and i've I've been playing with airpods my mum's got a set of airpods and with the the iphone they they just work so beautifully well and they sound fantastic i've also got a set of huawei freebuds 3 coming um which do a very very similar job um as i understand it and they're they're up challenging the airpods for uh, market space um but I've been really, really enjoying music again just because of that. So on one, in one um, sense, I've, I've been really enjoying vinyl still. But on, in the other sense, I've gone yeah. to the digital and really also enjoy what the, the new world has and how I can use that too. Yeah, very good. So we really do cover all the bases here on Chewing Gum for the Ears. Roll up, roll up. <laughs> <laughs> on the subject of rolling up, I never thought I'd be delivering this headline, but... Miley Cyrus covers Pink Floyd. Yes, you heard that right. You pointed me to this just before the show. Yeah. Miley Cyrus, who I actually quite like. I've, I've got several of her concerts on vid, on DVD, um, and I quite enjoy her music. You know, t- tapping along as I, I drive my car, and she got, she's got a decent voice and a decent personality from all the looks of it. Never mind swinging naked on a wrecking ball or whatever it was. Uh, on the whole, she's a you know a, 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 de- a serious rock singer. Um, and she has covered in these coronavirus days, apparently, Pink Floyd's Wish You Were Here. So I, I enjoyed it before the show and you liked it too? I did. I, I, I watched that a few days ago and it came around on my news feed. And she she performs um, Wish You Were Here. And it, it's actually very good. She, she, she's she got a good voice, I think. Um, I think we probably said on the show about her. Um, she's got a good voice. She does some good tunes. And this cover just sounded really well done. Recommended. And as you say, linking the show notes to that. Yes, absolutely. Um, now, we did have a theme for many of the past Chewing Gum for the Years. I know you had the, the theme of the 1980s lined up for this particular show, Show 20, and you've got some notes. So I don't know if you want to go through these, and I'll just chip in as we go. But it, if people remember that decade, then hopefully this will spark some some happy memories. If you never got acquainted with the 1980s, um, I've said in the past, it's not my favourite decade musically, but I do have some highlights, then this may also prompt other people to go and look up some of these artists so take it away ted yeah it was just a brainstorming exercise really i i, I kind of started thinking about the the, the 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 songs that i could remember i used to i did my, in the 1980s i did my psychiatric nurse training and um with a friend of mine 
we ran the disco in the social club, the hospital social club. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so all of these um, songs just mainly have come from there. And so a lot of them are quite dancey uh, tunes. Um, and I, I think that personally, I, I would not be particularly going for this except for that experience. So, so it was, it was basically a, a, a kind of um, brainstorming session. And here we go. Stop me if you want to. Visage, fade to grey. I, lo- <laughs> I love this. This is one of my earliest um, electronica, if you like, um, memories. It, up to the, the 70s, as you know, is all about, you know, guitar rock and so forth. Or, then the 1980s came along with synthesizers. And this was one of the first synthesizer centric pop songs that i really really enjoyed i i like you i was a dj at in, in university and this is one of the songs i always put on and it always got a good reaction yeah absolutely duran duran um a number of songs i, I remember the reflex girls on film which the video of which got banned i think <laughs> yeah. um planet earth was another one duran, i wasn't a big duran duran fan but i remember the hits spandau ballet to cut a long story short it springs to mind uh, culture club um and uh what's his name you know boy george you know boy george <laughs> <laughs> do you really want to hurt me which is a huge hit karma chameleon um victims was one uh, a really laid back slow um number which was right out of uh out of theme for culture club but it was a really nice song called victims um the power of love wasn't that a culture club or was that just um, boy george on his own um, I don't remember that being done by Coach Club or Boy George. Power of Love, I remember from either Frankie Goes to Hollywood or uh, yeah. someone else. <laughs> you're completely right. I've got the wrong. I've got the <laughs> wrong artist, and you're coming to Frankie. Carry on, carry on. Just ignore me. <laughs> Ultravox, um, Vienna. I used to love that song, yeah. and it was so good with um, Mid Europe, you know, and Team. Yeah. Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, OMD. And I, I really, really like, talk about electronica. Enola Gay, uh, Gray, um, Talking Loud and Clear, Made of Orleans, Joan of Arc, all of that stuff. I really, really like that, that whole sound of OMD. Yes, I was Dotty. One of my, one of the first singles I bought, I guess, not maybe in the sense, the first 10 singles I bought, um, given that I had a gap from going to university, was Electricity by OMD, which I just, I know it was only two minutes long and I felt cheated that... Uh, I paid them all this money for a single and got two minutes of music, but it's a cracking two minutes. Um, yeah. even, may even say crackling as it's you know about electricity. Um, but messages also just gets into your brain that dun, 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 you know the sort of a, the synthesizer intro is tremendous. Yeah, yeah, I, I really liked OMD. I used to have some twelve-inch singles of theirs, and they were great. Japan and David Sil- Sylvian um, second that emotion. I wasn't a big fan of Japan, but um, I, I was very aware of it. And we used to play that a lot. Soft Cell, Tainted Love, Say Hello, Wave Goodbye, I seem to recall. Tainted Love was the big one. Um, we played that an awful yeah, lot. Yeah, yeah. Tube Boy Army and Gary Newman, Cars, Our Friends Electric. Yes, I loved their first album. And Me, I Disconnect From You was my favourite track on that. And Gary Newman's still going. You know, He was on the Old Grey Whistle Test last year, I think. Um, and he was uh, performing with his daughter, who was providing backing vocals. So, and he's done some quite not depressing, but some quite heavyweight synthesizer-based albums in recent years. So, Gary Newman worth looking at even in 2020. Yeah. I, th- I think actually on a previous chewing gum episode, we had someone on that brought um, forward one of his albums, okay. his recent albums. Yeah, yeah. That, that came back to me when you said that. And yeah, there's uh, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, Relax, Two Tribes, which were the the big ones really. The album Welcome to the Pleasure Drive, I really really liked. And um, it got some bad press because they apparently used session artists and it wasn't them or something and blah, blah, blah. But I really, really like the structure of Welcome to the Pleasure Down. Do, do you know that one? Yeah, I, I like I, quite a few of Frankie's songs. And I'm, I'm wondering whether I should be embarrassed about liking Frankie's <laughs> songs. And I, I, good songs. I was a bit disturbed by some of the completely unnecessarily over the top gay visuals. I know they were trying to get a message across, but I've got, so I've got several gay friends but they don't go around in leather and outrageous outfits and studs and burying their body hair and going, ah, and all of that. <laughs> so I, I, I get what Frankie was trying to make a statement at the time, um, but I, I just it was a tiny bit over the top for me. Yeah, it was, it's, it's all showmanship, isn't it? Sure, and, sure. And, and yeah. at the time, they had, had great fun with it. Simple Minds, Promise You a Miracle. Wasn't a big fan, but I remember that. I do remember Kaj- Kajagoogoo very warmly. Too Shy 
was the, the the big hit that I remember. The Human League. Um, I used to really like the album Dare. Of course, Don't You Want Me um, was the single that everyone seems to know in the whole world. Uh, Love Action was another one. Um, and um, yeah, that, that whole Dare album. I think we've spoken about it before, haven't we? It seems that everyone's got yeah. Dare. Yeah. Landscape. Einstein at Go-Go, which if you, all you have to do is say that and everyone knows what song it is, I think. <laughs> Modern Romance. Ay, 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 Moosey. You've lost AB. me there. <laughs> yes. Oh, sorry. Um, that's a, 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 a Moosey was a song that everyone did the the kind of can can, not the can can, the what's the thing where you grab the person in front of you and go around in a circle? Um, the, you know, you know. Not the okie cokey, the um, yes, yes, yes. I know the one you mean. Everyone you knows what you yeah, you dance around in a in a kind yeah, of circle. Yeah. And that was the AIA Moosey thing, I think. ABC were quite big. The Look of Love, Pointed Arrow, um, po- um, Poison Arrow. Shoot the Poison Arrow, wasn't it? I think I um, seem to remember that. Haircut 100, Love Plus One, Heaven 17, Temptation, Blamange, Living on the Ceiling. They were good fun. And again, completely over the top with all their showmanship. Adam and the Ants were quite big. Um Prince Charming, I remember. A very, very distinctive look and approach. And apparently, before they ever got famous, they had a huge following. And there was a great local scene around Adam and the Ants, and they they were doing really well. I just didn't like it. I I thought the whole storytelling pop videos was so over the top. I I, I think maybe I was going through a minimalist phase where I wanted Pants to stand up, sing the songs and get off. And he had this all of this outrageous dressing up and storytelling, <laughs> which in, in hindsight, I'm you know quite nostalgic for. But at the time, I hated him. Yeah. Simple Minds, promise you a miracle. Fun Boy 3. I really like the Fun Boy 3. The whole, um, the lunatics have taken over the asylum and the, the whole approach to this kind of, um, the three of them and, and the, the whole beat of their music and the, the whole, I don't know the technicalities of what it was called. Um, it's probably something, some kind of, some kind of scar thing, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway, yeah. It, it was really um, enjoyable stuff. I loved that. And then some more mainstream stuff, I suppose, like Bowie, Ashes to Ashes. Yeah, yeah. He's, he's always worth a listen at any era, Mr. Bowie. Um, I still prefer him with um, the group in the 1970s. What was his backing band? It's David Bowie and Spiders from Mars, that's Spiders, it. Yeah. yeah, so I still prefer his that early creative surge. Those the three or four albums there in the 70s are just stunning, even today. Yeah, but Ashes absolutely. to Ashes was always interesting. A lad insane, um, Diamond Dogs. Um, yeah, yeah. And and so on. That that, yeah. that as you say that that um, Ziggy Stardust album. Yeah, all of those yeah, were, stunning. were great. Yeah. And we should say Bowie, of course, not Bowie. I, I when I was younger, <laughs> I, I, I for some reason I always said Bowie, and uh, everyone else in the world that know what it should be say Bowie. It's got to be Bowie. Roxy Music, Slave to Love. There is lots of good stuff about Roxy Music online. I it kind of missed me at the day uh, because it was all part of you know glam rock, and they kind of got characterised in that that vein but they they did some pretty good tracks and some pretty serious music and if you go and searching for roxy music live on youtube there's an awful lot of great material including a really quite serious and and excellent cover of neil young's like a hurricane from 1982 we'll put the link to that one in the youtube uh, the youtube link in the show notes because it's it's worth watching and it's about 15 minutes long but there we are but they were a serious band yeah, yeah, they they were and um, had a huge following. Yeah. I don't know Like a Hurricane, I have to say, but um, I should have a look at that one you for will, sure. When, when you watch the YouTube video later, Ted, you'll think, oh, it's that one. Yeah. Okay, yeah, <laughs> fair enough. Banana Rama, who, in the same vein as Fun Boy 3, I think, um, and I remember one particular track that was very popular in the disco, Robert De Niro's Waiting. Everyone loved that one, and we loved playing it. Bucks Fizz, um Eurovision Song Contest um, band. Oh dear, uh, we're or, plumbing new depths here, aren't we? Yeah, the land of make believe. I remember, which was really popular in the disco. Altered images. I could be happy and happy birthday. A- again, lots of dressing up and outrageous behaviour. Imagination. Back to the body talk. Um, imagination. Um, I kind of put in the same category as um, uh, as Ultravox. I think that kind of same theme stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, craft work, which you'll jump at, no doubt, because um, we've spoken about it on the show before and you were a fan, weren't you? Yes, I, I've got several craft work albums. And again, it's not something I could listen to every day. And the music does seem to have dated rather more than more gentle stuff like Tangerine Dream, which is more ambient and you can right. listen to any time. Craft work is, is just that bit edgier and more mechanical. Um, but this is one of their more popular uh, songs. The model, I think, got into the charts. Yeah. 
It did very, very successfully. <laughs> um, and it was a good song. Tony Basil with Mickey. And lastly on my list of brainstorming was the fun Captain Sensible with Happy Talk. <laughs> and everyone loved that. that, particularly at Christmas. I don't remember that. He was in The Damned, wasn't he? Yes, he was. That's right. <laughs> well, I have no idea what Happy Talk I have to go and look at uh, the YouTube. Happy, happy, happy talk. Yes, I know the song, but what the heck was he doing singing it? Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> anyway, are you trying to brainwash me, by the way? Because Simple Minds <laughs> are in your list twice. Oh, are they? Is, is that a oh, subliminal dear. way to say you really, really want to plug Simple Minds? Oh, yeah, you're right. They are twice. I do apologise. <laughs> Simple Minds were a great band, actually. I've got their, I've only got their greatest hits, admittedly, but I, I do enjoy a good Simple Minds listen once a year. Very good. And you added a couple of things to my list as well, didn't you? Yeah, I, this is all much more um, serious and <laughs> highbrow than some of your uh, disco lists. But you two, of course, released their incredibly popular The Joshua Tree album during the, the 80s. Um, there's actually a Joshua Tree Deluxe ver- version you can get now with loads of extra tracks and alternative versions. And that's worth seeking out. Um, Mike and the Mechanics, um, The Living Years, one of my favourite songs of all time. Uh, Mike Rutherford, of course, ex-Genesis, and he's doing one of his solo things. But um, you must have heard The Living Years, a good song. I haven't heard that. I can't recall it. And it I, was number I, one for ages, Ted. OK, well, maybe it was in the wrong time for me. What what <laughs> decade are we in here? Oh, I'm, well, it's mid-80s, I'm guessing. Maybe I'm late sure 80s. I was still in the 80s. Mike and the Mechanics, I know the um, band, but I really am completely unfamiliar with them. And we certainly didn't have any disco stuff from them. <laughs> I'm now looking at the Living Years entry on Wikipedia, and it came out in 1989. So I only—I ju- am right, uh, but only just. I was um, sensibly married by then. <laughs> <laughs> um, my cop out, actually, to, to say that most of my favourite acts of the 1970s carried on into the 1980s. So not just you two, but Pink Floyd, of course, Neil Young, Tangerine Dream, and many others all carry on producing music. Uh, and I, which I thoroughly enjoyed and, and enjoyed, you know, collecting all their new stuff. And people don't remember it now, of course, with the classic acts like David Bowie. Um, <laughs> I had to get the pronunciation right for once. Yeah. But, but now you think, OK, well, there's, he's, he's long and gone and sadly missed, but there is an entire back catalogue. But back in the day, he'd done four albums and here was a brand new album from this artist. Um, and you had the excitement of these me- what now considered to be legendary artists producing brand new material that no one had heard before coming out in front of our very eyes. And that was quite exciting. Yeah, good stuff. So, yeah, you're right. The, 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 the big artists do, even if they're not still writing, they bring out new things. Like you were saying about your CDs earlier and, and enhanced versions and yeah, revamped yeah, yeah. versions. It, it's all good stuff. I mean, the, the the theme of the 1980s to me was all about modern romance and, and um, you know, the, the kind of digital um, movement towards a different... Like you were saying about um, craft work, really. The, it, it's all electronic stuff. And, and that, to me was the theme of the 80s though not yeah. about people that were still hanging on from the 70s um but yes each each has its own benefit of course yeah well so well it was modern romance did work for you because you were married by the end of the 80s so there we are yeah I, all of my references you see we, we i finished doing my psyche nurse training by um 1985 and and that was it i i, I really stopped listening to music um and i was buried back in what i knew by then so by the time it got to 1989 yeah i was finished really um and i was hanging on to what you're saying about you know the the, the releasing of pink floyd stuff yeah, as yeah. the artists that i knew and i'd hung on to and and um, moving forward in that sort of way but yeah i do remember very very warmly the certainly the the first half of the 80s and that modern romantics kind of era and I'm just typing in Pink Floyd discography because, of course, the wall from the Pink Floyd was also yeah. in the 1980s. Yeah, yeah. Yes, it was. We should have mentioned that, I suppose. Um, <laughs> and, and also, I think Anim- wasn't, when was Animals released? And that was 77. That was 77, the 70s, yeah. yeah. Oh, and the wall was 79. That just, ex- just excluded. So you're quite correct in not yeah. mentioning it. But I think the wall was certainly considered through the early 80s one of the you know dominant double albums that everyone should listen to and own the, the wall um i remember from 1980 itself the, yeah, the release yeah. of um uh i we don't got no education what's that song yeah, called the, the, another brick in the wall part two was <laughs> that's that? the one yeah, yeah. yeah um that was in that was definitely in the 1980s that that was yeah, released yeah. as a single um and of course from then i know you don't like the album but i think it's brilliant is the final cut and that was even further on wasn't it so that Yes, certainly into the 80s, Pink Floyd was still writing. And, and, and as far as I'm concerned, anyway, even if you disagree, really good music. 
I, when you say I don't like an, a Pink Floyd album, that's like saying, um, which is your least favourite child? And you've got 15 children. <laughs> you still love them all. You still like them all. You, but you don't have a favourite. So that, I think any Pink Floyd album will be somewhere with something to enjoy. I'm not going to say I, I certainly don't, don't dislike it. I'm just saying it's not one of my favourites. You should. We, we've had this discussion before, and you should have. Um, <laughs> you, you should. You should take that as your homework to go and re-listen um, to the final cut yeah, yeah, and give, yeah. and give it another to. chance, and also to to give Roger Waters a chance on his solo albums because some of them are really good. Um, amused, I, to, amused to death. It's really, really Pink Floyd like as an album as well. You should try it again. I did. I, I, in the, one of the previous shows, I went back and listened to both of. I think is there two Roger Waters solo albums? Well, it's about four or five now. All right. Okay. All right. Well, I, I listened to two of them, and I remember quite struck by some of the political lyrics and the yeah, real yeah. savagery yeah. he puts in. Rightly so, um, ridiculing you know political leaders. And I thought that he's, it, Roger Waters really was the the lyrical cutting edge of Pink Floyd. Absolutely, no questions asked. Dave yeah. Gilmore is perhaps the the musical soul, but Roger, it was the combination of the two of them that made those central three or four albums so special. Yeah, um, I, I see in your list as well, you mentioned earlier, um, Tangerine Dream. Now, this is a band that um, I was slightly aware of because a friend of mine was into it, and they had this album called Phaedra, is that right? Phaedra, yeah. yeah. Phaedra. Um, and I can remember listening to that and being really uh, thinking, this is, you know, you need to be smoking weed listening to this, really. The, and this is what it's all about, is the, the kind of 60s hangover. Is that Would that be right? Yeah, so there, there was a com- combination of hippie philosophy and yet modern, or as it was considered then, sequencers. So this would have been about 1980. I went to, it was at university in Oxford, and I went to see them at the Oxford Apollo. And all I remember is a dark stage with a, a, a sort of semi-opaque curtain separating the band from the audience. The, the musicians basically had their backs to the audience, the whole concert, and in front of each musician was this wall, absolute wall of computers and sequencers and flashing lights. And for a proto geek like myself, it was like, wow, this is like Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Right. But these amazing um, spe- spectral noises and b- bass notes that sort of vibrated your rib cage, all coming out of these these banks of machines. And it was just unbelievable. Um, the best introduction probably to Tangerine Dream, rather than start with Phydra, which is a bit you know spacey and atmospheric, Start with something like their double live album, which is called Encore, I believe, um, and recorded in about late 70s. And Cherokee Lane in particular, the, the side one, Cherokee Lane, if you can get through that, and re- you'll really enjoy that. That got me through many an essay at university. You just uh, 20 minutes long and you, you just cycle it through over and over again. It, it's, it's atmospheric, it's driving, it's energetic, it's inspirational. And uh, yeah, Cherokee Lane for the win here of Tangerine mm. Dream. Very good. Okay, well, before we move on or go, whichever comes first, <laughs> I just thought I'd have a quick look at what people are talking about in the chewing gum group in MeWe. Okay. Um, and a quick run through that. Chris Kelly has mentioned and linked to a great version of a classic, which is Santana, um, while my guitar oh, yes. gently weeps. Um, and he links through to an Amazon Music um, version of that, but I also linked through to the um, the uh, the Google Play Music one, and also someone, Mike Latour, has linked through to a YouTube uh, video of uh, Peter Frampton in the same vein. Yeah, I've got that on my in my iTunes here. Guitar Heaven, the greatest guitar classics of all time, ah. it, with um, special guest the Carlos Santana, and uh, and some of the tracks aren't necessarily top notch. I have to say, a mixture in the album to get mixed reviews, but the versions of Can't You Hear Me Knocking, uh, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, uh, Riders on the Storm, which is the old classic Doors song, of course, and Little Wing from Jimi Hendrix. Those four covers, they are really worth listening to. So get the album, if only for those four tracks. But yes, the While My Guitar Gently Weeps is a very, very good version with Carlos Santana on guitar. OK. Um, Kathy Muir was up as well doing a performance on Instagram. I'm not an Instagram user, but apparently on Instagram, um, she's performing to help the Red Cross and the NHS. Uh, Scottish singer-songwriter, I'm not very much aware of her, I'm afraid, but um, apparently it's a nice sound. And on Instagram, again, we'll link in the show notes to this, she's doing on Saturday evenings, um, 30 minutes of, um, of stuff until, a bit like us really, uh, a, a lockdown special. So have a look at that one. Are you familiar with her? 
Not at all. Um, I will, however, link in while you're still thinking about the next thing, is that I watched Local Hero, the film with my wife the other night. Um, I think it was on TV. Um, and I hadn't seen the film for about 20 or 30 years. It was, I think it was released in about 1982. So again, it fits with the 80s theme. But right. of course, the famous thing there is it's Mark, Mark Knopfler doing the soundtrack. And it gave me a whole extra enthusiasm for what became one of the most quoted soundtrack albums on, on the early Chewing Gum for the Years episode. So again, yeah. Local Hero Soundtrack by Mark Knopfler. Very good. Um, I linked you <laughs> a few days ago, a week or so ago, to um, Pink Floyd streaming. Now, you did what, you went and looked oh, yeah. this up, didn't you? Um, they were doing weekly YouTube series during lockdown. Do you remember that? Yeah, I think Dave Gilmore and the other Floyd um, management have been making the most of trying to sell their ex very expensive box set of CDs, DVDs, Blu-rays, etc. But as a promotional thing for that, they've been releasing all sorts of um, some of that material that you'd otherwise get an optical disc in streaming format on the likes of YouTube. Now, obviously, people like in the know, like myself, can to a certain extent can rip from YouTube. And of course, you can just watch it, stream it, online whenever you want but there are many of those um, re digitally remastered audio uh, re-released um, video shows including the famous pulse concert they're all up now on the various pink floyd channels and very well worth a watch and excellent audio so plug your headphones in and the other day they had a um, a premiere or they call it a premiere of the and yet another remix yet another um, remaster of the Pink Floyd Live in Pompeii, where the d d director keeps tinkering with it and adding extra bits and different visual effects and taking out one song and putting another one in. Um, so there's now three different versions of Pink Floyd Live at Pompeii. But up on, on the on the internet, we'll try and find the link for the show notes, is the, the latest one. Always enjoyable. I still prefer the original with just the band and, and relatively few visual effects. Very good. Um, Genesis announcing their reunion. <laughs> is is it the full reunion though, or is it just Phil, Mike, and um, Tony? Tony, yes, Phil, Mike, yeah. and Tony. Um, first time since two thousand and seven. Um, I'll put a link in the show notes to that story as well. And lastly, from the group, I just wanted to mention we can't go through a show without mentioning um, Rick Wakeman. And I discovered um, some albums of his, which I didn't know were out there, between 1986 and 1990, called Country Airs, Sea Airs and Night Airs. And they mm. really are. This this just confirmed to me what Rick Wakeman, as a, 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 um, as a keyboard player, is just so genius. Um, this isn't just him with a... Um, with a, a keyboard, but there is some orchestral backup as well. But it's a really nice sound, and he's 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 produced these three albums of mood music that are really worth a visit. I think again, I'll, I'll link yeah. to that in the show notes. Have you read or listened to in audio book form the Rick Wakeman's? Um, is it called Tales from a Grumpy Rock Star? Something like that. Oh, he, no. He's done two books with anecdotes from his musical history. Very very colourful history incredibly funny incredibly interesting it's available in both you know kindle form physical form or audiobook form read by himself and highly 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 recommended mm. rick wakeman and uh, i think the title something along the lines was grumpy old rock star okay and in true um projector room style just to mention final curtain um bill withers died last month um aged 81 i couldn't believe how old he was um, and no doubt you'll know who that is. And um, yeah. well, every, uh, lots of people will remember very well all of his music. So, yes, um, gone, but not forgotten. Yeah, I guess so. We should do a more frequent podcast if you want to cover the people that passed away from the music <laughs> industry. But, but yes, uh, sad to see. Um, I think we're done for this, this uh, intermittent, irregular podcast. Had any last words, you think? Yeah, yeah. Just the usual plug for Podhub UK, all the other audio podcasts, get across there and listen to what we're up to in the world of podcasting, Steve and I and all of our friends. My podcasting empire is growing, I tell you, growing. <laughs> anyway, yes, uh, with with myself, Ted, Gareth Miles, um, Aidan Bell, even Kev Wright and Richard Yates, they're on Tech Talk UK, is now back on, Dave Rich and, and many others who I, I won't name. But yes, there's an awful lot to listen to from British podcasters. You don't have to listen to Americans and have lots of adverts all over the shop. So there we are. Thank you very much. A cheery goodbye from Ted, I guess, or whatever we goodbye. do at the end of this podcast. And I'll say goodbye. This has been Chewing Gum for the Ears. <laughs> <laughs>